First on Radio 4, we continue with the second of our series, The Great Scott, dramatisations of classic novels by Walter Scott, with David Tennant as the narrator. This week, it's Rob Roy. We present Rob Roy by Walter Scott. Adapted for radio by Robin Brooks. Paris. Ah, Paris. When he turned 21, Frank's father sent him to Paris to study commerce as a precursor to taking up a role in the family business. Paris is trying to forget the war and Frank is keen to help. But then, abruptly, he is summoned home and ordered to present himself at his father's London office. Frank is not entirely surprised. Dubourg writes that he is happy with you. Father, I am happy. But I am less so. I am sorry, Father. Happy or sorry does not signify. I refer to your last letter, yours of the 21st Ultimo. Yes, sir. In which you advise me that, in the important matter of choosing a profession, you have an insuperable... Uh, insuperable is the word. Oh, by the way, Frank, I do wish you would write a more distinct hand, draw a score through the tops of your T's and open the loops of your L's. Sir. An insuperable <laughs> objection to the arrangements which I've proposed for you. Yes, I'm afraid. And there is much more to the same effect, occupying four good pages of paper, <laughs> which a little attention to directness of expression might have shortened. For all it amounts to is that you will not do as I would have you. Sir, I only want Am to... Am I right in thinking that you have neglected your mercantile Studies. Well, sir, I... Uh, how did Dubon permit this? How does he write to me and tell me that your progress is satisfactory? He... Well, sir, he... Owen! Sir! Uh, Hello, Owen. Mr. Frank, sir, it's so good to see you, you sir. You have been wasting your time like a boy. But I shall put you under Owen's care for a few months to make up lost ground. I'm sorry that my letter was unsatisfactory, Father, but I stand by what I said in it. I am not cut out for the financial world. Oh, so, what will you do instead? I, I would like to travel for a year or two. <laughs> then, then perhaps I could spend some time at Oxford or Cambridge. You're too old for that now. Then I would be happy to return to Paris. <laughs> I bet you would. And what would you do there? Write poetry. Poetry? I've already had some verses published in a review edited by Ezra Pound. Who? Here. A furled umbrella on the omnibus, the cracked boots of the porter at the Gare du Nord. My heart is wrapped in silence. My heart leaks. Very nice, Mr. Frank. Ought not good poetry to rhyme? Oughtn't it to have meter? These are old-fashioned Ought notions. Ought it not be written by an utter ninny? You are a bigger fool than I took you for. Frank, I was about your age when my father threw me out hmm, and settled our old house in the north on my younger brother. I have never been back since, but I know my brother has sons, and I swear, if you continue to cross me, one of them shall be my heir. You can do as you please. Sir, please, Mr. Frank loves you, I'm sure. Don't be in such a hurry, sir. Oh, and do you think I would ask him twice? To be my assistant, my confidant, my friend? To be a partner of my cares and fortune? You know me better than that. Miss Blythe? Miss Blythe! Oh, Mr. Frank, think, sir, of what you were going to lose. One of the most prosperous houses in the city. My father can dispose of his cash as he pleases. You have ruined yourself. Why does he want to force me into a lifetime of money grubbing? Don't we have enough of the stuff? I, I would never be as good as him at getting it or keeping it. He was depending on you, Frank. Uh, he had all his hopes on you. He can't carry on forever. Thank you, Miss Bly. So, Frank, uh, how will you support yourself in your new life? Oh, perhaps you will get uh, money by your poems? Not enough to live on. Would you like me to continue your allowance? Yes, please. I will do so. On condition, you go north immediately. You will visit your uncle and meet his family. 
I will send for one of his sons to replace you here, and you may stay at Osbald Hall until you hear from me again. I have telegraphed your uncle, and a seat is being booked for you on the Flying Scotsman. Sir. In third class. So Frank hurtles north on the Flying Dutchman, or whatever you call it, and as the smoke and hum of London fades, he is conscious that he is leaving behind the comfort and charms of metropolitan society. It all happened rather quickly, and his muse has deserted him, the trollop. He stares at the brown, lumpy Pennines wheeling by, and no poem comes. Not even the thoroughly proletarian fellow passengers in third class inspire him, and they have plenty of cracked boots. By the time they get to Doncaster, he's feeling a wee bit flat. To reach Oswald Hall, Frank has to change at Darlington, and in the station Buffy, besides himself, there are only two travellers. One is a big-looking fellow sitting over in the corner, and just opposite Frank is a pale-looking gentleman who has a small but sturdy case on his knee. I say, are you waiting for the Newton Abbott service? I can't say just now. Mm. The station master says it's delayed. Another half hour. Yes. But there's just the two of us for it, it looks like. If you are... W- would you like a cup of tea? I'm, I'm going to have one, I think. Forgive me. I never accept drinks from strangers. Where is the waitress? I can watch your box for you, if you like. Um, that's quite all right. It looks rather heavy. It's nothing. N- nothing at all. I'm Frank Osbald. How do you do? Your paper, did you buy it in London? Oh, no. It's, it's the Glasgow Herald. I just picked it up. There's nothing in the news but the ghastly business in Dublin. They've shot Erskine Childers. Why would they shoot Erskine Childers? He was bare in arms. Oh, a small revolver given him by Michael Collins. He was a dangerous man. Forgive me, you must know more about these things. No, no, I, I've been out of Ireland a long while now. Well, here's something, though. Railway robbery. What's that? Local hero fights branch line gangsters. Let me see. Here. Rob Roy, as bold as a lion, fought off seven of the men who waylaid him as he alighted from the last train to Newton Abbott. And there's a photograph of the man. It doesn't show him well. Fought off seven? Hmm? It was only two. Cowardly boys at that, with wee hankies across their faces and service revolvers too heavy for their skinny wrists. Too young to have seen the real fighting. The photo hardly does me justice. You are the local hero, Mr. Roy. Can't really see what a handsome devil I am. Yes, it is you. Are you going north tonight, Mr. Roy? No. That is a great shame. A man would give a lot to know he travelled in safety. I'm the other way. I have business at Rothbury. I could wait. I I would make it worth your while. I'm travelling on my own private affairs, so... This gentleman is going that way. Yes, I am. He will keep you company. I've decided not to take the train yet. I may wait. Good evening to you, gentlemen. Good evening. He's not very friendly. He thinks you're a villain. He can please himself. Osbald, you say your name is? Yes. On your way to Osbald Hall? Yes, do you know it? Aye, I know the family in a small way. You're not of them. A London cousin. Are you now? Mm. Can you play golf? Golf? No. Ah. <laughs> What a curious fellow. When he alights from the branch line train, there is no one to meet him at the station, so he sets off to walk, following the direction of a signpost to Oswald Hall. The Cheviots rise before us, huge, round-headed, clothed in russet. It's beautiful. Frank's father left his homeland when he was a young man, and until now, Frank himself has never been further north than Kentish town. But in his imagination, it's a different story. Frank's father, when he came to London, brought with him his nurse, an old Northumbrian woman called Mabel Ricketts. She became, in turn, Frank's nurse, and during all his childhood illnesses, she lulled and soothed him with the legends of the borders. But the thing is, Mabel's bedtime stories abounded in violence, and Frank learnt from an early age to look on the Scottish people as a race hostile by nature to their southern neighbours. According to what he can gather from the stories, the Scots seem to be bloodthirsty, treacherous, self-interested, avaricious and tricky, with few good qualities, 
except for ferocious martial courage and a sort of low cunning. When he reaches the top of a foothill, he sees the house at some distance, standing in a grove of ancient oaks. As he starts down towards it, he notices that the grass is mown short. I must be entering the park. Suddenly, something small and white lands on the grass beside him. What the... On the slope above him is a group of men waving sticks. Get off the fairway, you idiot! I'm on a golf course. Yes, you are. He steps aside into the edge of the trees while they go past. Among them is a striking young woman dressed in slacks with bobbed hair. She alone comes to speak to him. I'm wondering if you know anything of one Frank Oswald expected here at the hall? I am he. I had a feeling you might be. Allow me to take you there. You are very kind. My cousins should do the honours, but they're fonder of the game than their manners. Uh. <laughs> the gentleman in the tartan plus twos is my uncle. Yours too, I think. Yes. Do you play? No. Then what on earth brings you here? There's nothing else to do. There is one exception. Oh, you mean Rashley? Who is Rashley? My uncle's youngest son, about your age. Not not so good looking, oh. but he is the cleverest man in the county. You will think him the best company you ever had in your life. And so well spoken. If he could find a blind woman, he'd make her his mistress like that. The house is a jumble of stone latticed windows and projecting turrets. Our new friend leaves Frank to change, directing him to the dining hall, a vaulted room with a long oak table where we find his uncle, triumphantly returned from the course, surrounded by a bevy of sportsmen. Uncle Hilary has the trapping of a gentleman, like a weathered old Corinthian column overgrown with moss and lichen. But his sons look rather like something you might see at Stonehenge, rough, heavy and unhewn, except for Rashley. Rashley is different. He is not tall or handsome like his brothers. His features are irregular. In fact, they are downright ugly. But in his keen, dark eyes, there burns the light of a fierce intelligence and something that may, if provoked, prove very, very dangerous. Without wanting to give you too many clues about whether he might possibly turn out to be some sort of villain, I might mention that something about him reminds Frank of a poisonous snake. No, she said. I'm using a left-handed butter. <laughs> Welcome, nephew. What's your handicap? I, I beg your pardon? He doesn't play, Uncle. Eh? Doesn't play? Mm. Uh, this is your cousin Henry. Uh, how do you do? Don't play. No. And cousin Percy. Don't play? No. <laughs> what do you do? <laughs> and Rashley. Where's Rashley? Here, father. Rashley doesn't play either. Ah, and here's my little Di, my wife's brother's daughter. Ah. The prettiest girl in the Dales oh. and the sweeter, straighter putter never graced our greens. Oh. <laughs> We've met. And here's Sapper. Oh. Oh. Sit by me. Gladly. We'll put Henry on the other side of you. I don't want Rashley. We'll use Henry as insulation. Henry won't listen. He'll be too busy stuffing himself. Isn't that right, Henry? <laughs> what? So, how do you like us? It's a little soon to say. I can tell you what you'll think. Henry's a bully. Percy is a sot. I love my uncle, so I'll not include him. I see. And now you're wondering how to describe me. How could I be thinking of anything else? Frank, I must tell you straight away that compliments are wasted on me. They are like the beads and bracelets carried by explorers to charm savages. I know their real value. Um... <laughs> you remind me of the young man in the fairy tale who finds all the money he had carried to market suddenly changed into pieces of slate. <laughs> Never mind. I prefer your natural swing. Forget my sex. Call me Tom, if you like. But speak to me as a friend and you will have no idea how much I shall like you. That would be a decent bribe. I told you, no compliments. If I'm not allowed to praise you, then I can't tell you what I really think of you. You don't need to, I can tell you. You think me a strange, bold girl, half flirt, half tomboy, who aims to attract attention by flouting convention and perhaps plans to bowl you over with her free and easy style. I never thought of you. <laughs> but you are wrong. I talk to you because I am as short of intelligent company as Lawrence in the desert. And you are at least, I think, I hope, Hope intelligent. Well, so I must speak or die. 
You, you've not mentioned Cousin Rashley in your description. Not a word. His ears are so sharp in his own self-interest that the sounds would reach him even through Henry's beef-stuffed frame. But he isn't here. He left the table. That doesn't mean you're safe. If you want to talk about Rashley, get up onto the top of Otterscope Hill, where you can see for 20 miles around and speak in whispers. That sounds bitter. Rashley has been my tutor for some time. We are heartily sick of each other and both look forward to his departure. Where is he going? Why don't you know? To your father's? To sit on your stool at the bank? It's not really a bank. We're all delighted to see the back of him. He's the youngest son, but he's got everyone here under his thumb. If you get in his way, you'll regret it. Frank, your glass is empty. (laughs) Go easy. The port will be coming round soon, which means ladies may retire. And as I am the only lady at Oswald Hall, I will. Did Frank's father know what Frank would find here? Frank assumes he's been sent to Oswald Hall so that among boars and bumpkins he will regret what he has given up and come round to his father's way of thinking. But now, here is this extraordinary girl, extremely pretty, rather wild and seemingly lonely. Perhaps his father's plan has backfired. When Frank goes to bed, he dreams of her, and hers is the first face he sees in the morning. Wake up! What? Frank, wake up! What are you doing in here? You shouldn't... Get up. I have something to show you. Come on, get up. Hop in. This is a fine-looking machine. How did you learn to drive it? Trial and error. Where are we going? Otterscope Hill. It is a fine view. Yes. You really can see for 20 miles. Pretty much. Is this what you wanted to show me? Do you see that crooked peak? At the end of the ridge? Yes. That's Scotland. That's the border. Mm. We could be there in half an hour. It's a long way to go for a picnic. (laughs) Our county constabulary's writ does not run beyond it. They're not friends with the Scottish force. The Scottish police will not help them to apprehend you. What? You really don't know what I'm talking about? No. Do you know a man named O'Brien? You met him recently? No. He remembers you. He's been robbed, and he says you did it. What? Our local Bobby's on his way to arrest you. The magistrate is a friend of mine. He kindly telegraphed to say he's been writing out your warrant. I don't believe it. You look like a startled horse. (laughs) Don't fret. It's not petty larceny. It was a great deal of money. Robbery with violence. Where is this magistrate? You can see his clock tower beyond the wood. There. Take me to him. Are you sure you wouldn't rather go to Scotland? Certainly not. The accusation is false. Please yourself. Rashley, what's he doing here? Good morning. I'm disappointed to see you here, Frank. I'd hoped you might be over the hills and far away by now. I am innocent. Oh, of course. What brings you here, Rashley? I thought I might try to help straighten things out. You're mixed up in this, aren't you? I bet your pardon. I bet you know who really did it. Cousin, you are quite crazy. Rashley knows everything that goes on here. He'll know all about your robbery. He was probably there. You must have noticed, Frank, that our young cousin is beautiful but a bit cracked. But you can toddle off and straighten things out, can you? Perhaps. Well, toddle then. Come on, Frank, come and meet the magistrate. Diana, this is a pleasure. Is it too early for a cocktail? By about 12 hours. A prairie oyster? I could do with one. (laughs) So could this young man by the look of him. This is my cousin Frank. Ah, the desperate villain. Are you desperate for a prairie oyster, Frank? No. Well, I am. Oh, die, what fun. I'll telephone Larry and Petra. You absolutely must stay for lunch. We could have a little tea dance. I yearn to perform the black bottom with you. I just came with Frank. I must drive him home again. Oh, that's the way the wind blows, is it? A lucky Frank. But perhaps he can't go home. Perhaps I must bung him in chokey. What for? Oh, let's see. Uh, Mr. O'Brien? Mr. O'Brien, we need you, please. 
Mr. O'Brien, is this the man? Yes, it's you. So you've met them? He was at the station buffet. I lent him my paper. Mr. O'Brien? He followed me out. There were two of them. They had guns and they wore masks, but one of them spoke and he called the other one Oswald. It's him, all right. Dear me, but boys will be boys. <laughs> Vodka or whiskey in your oyster? I don't want a drink. I'll tell you what, Frank. Why don't you just quietly hand back the moolah and we'll say no more about it? I can't because I don't have it. Because I didn't take it. Sir. Yes, what is it? A gentleman, sir. Well, tell him to go away. We're having a party. Sir, I'm afraid he is most insistent. I beg your pardon. My business won't wait. Oh, really? My business is with Mr. O'Brien here. Mr. O'Brien, I believe you can what I am. You'll have need difficulty telling Mr. Magistrate that I'm an honest man. I... I... yes. And I'm the man that was with you when you lost your valise. Yes. Yes. I never mentioned you before. He did not want to implicate me in this business. It was kindly meant. Yes. But I was there. And I saw the whole thing. And I will swear that this young man here was not the man. I had a glisk of the robber's face when the mask slipped. And this is not the man. Now I come to think of it, it isn't. I agree. I absolutely agree. I, I would like to retract my accusation against Mr. Oswald. Oh, goody. That clears that up, then. Now you come along with me, Mr. O'Brien. Um, come along, man. I'll see you safe. I don't think I want to. I swear I will not harm you. Maybe I can help you find what's lost. Come. You swear? I'll keep my word, Mr. O'Brien. I'm a man who keeps his word. Can you not see that? Very well. Come. What a fuss. That man, that Scotsman, was in the buffet. He was in the station buffet. Mr. Roy. Fascinating. Now, you can stay to lunch, darling Diana. You have no excuse. I must take my cousin home. Oh, nuts to your cousin. What about the older man, my sweet bud of the wilderness? Is there no luck for him? No. Oh. Rashley's the man. He does what he likes and everybody dances to his tune. You think he has something to do with that Roy? And do you think Roy was mixed up in the robbery? That man seems scared to death of him. But Roy was in the paper for fighting off robbers. And your magistrate recognised him, I think, but he didn't say. I can't tell you. But... I could, but I shan't. What? Why not? Frank, I am, as you can clearly see, a straightforward, true-hearted girl. I don't... I'm honest and open by nature, but I am in a bunker. I am deep in sand. I am hopelessly stuck so that I daren't speak, and I can't. I simply can't answer questions, not for my own sake. Really? Yes, really. You have no idea how hard I work to hide my aching heart. You are a reasonably perceptive young man. What? And of course you want to know what's going on. And I can't tell you, but I can't bear to lie to you either. So could you just very kindly not ask me any questions? Very well. But if I can help in any way, then please ask me. I will do whatever I can to help you, if you need it. Thank you. When we are back at the hall, there will be times I cannot speak. Mm -hmm. But I want you to at least know when they are. So I'll touch my chin like this. Oh, oh. Right. Because you are my trusted confidant now. Despite the fact that you know nothing about my affairs and I can't tell you anything. <laughs> but I can show you my secret lair, where I'm safe from the golfing orangutans. Where is that? The library. Once upon a time, I shared this library with Rashley, when we were friends. You are not friends anymore? We're allies. We have mutual interests. He used to be my tutor, but now I study alone. What studies? Ancient history, current affairs. Mm. This is my little den now. I don't see anything to make it yours. A apart from maybe... The pictures? Mm. Yes. The portrait in oils is my great-grandfather. Oh. He fought against the British with Robert Emmett. The photograph? Is my father. He fought against the British with Patrick Pierce. I detect a theme. And my father fought with Michael Collins in the Civil War. And then we... Lost him. Oh. That is why I am here. An orphan girl, living with her uncle. But I am proud of him. I don't support. In Ireland, the British have not behaved. Prouder than if he had gone to the winning side and got himself a ministry in the free state. That's Rashley. Rashley, why do you knock? You know I'm not alone. Hobbit. 
I think I might have you to thank for my release today. Ah. I wasn't sure, but when I asked Miss Vernon, she referred me to you. It was nothing. I happened across the man Roy by accident and persuaded him to speak up. Happened across him? I know Roy in a general way. He's something of a local figure. Do you think he actually took part in the robbery? O'Brien seems scared to death of him. I hear a rumour O'Brien was on a delicate mission, not mere commercial interests. No. Something political. Really? Mm. I will leave you, gentlemen. I wish you a good evening. Have we offended? Miss Vernon feels cooped up here. She's not happy. It's a form of exile for her. But without the consolation of art, of poetry, for instance. Poetry? I may as well confess I am a subscriber to Mr. Pound's review. Oh. I knew your name long before you came here. Really? Kitchen smells. The pink and yellow dawn. Among the cabbage leaves, the porters yawn. Lump de mer. Blanc bizarro. Lamplight falters. Shall we go? You know it. Uh, do, do you... Do, do you... What do you think? <laughs> I can't say how much I like it. You are an admirer of La Forge. Yes, of course, of course. You? Me, oui. But I understand I must keep quiet about it when I take my place in your father's business. Yes, you absolutely must. You must tell me all about your father. I hope you don't bear me any ill will. Not at all. And I will tell you about Miss Vernon, if you like. Please. But first... A word of caution. What? You're a man of the world. Well, you, you must have noticed that she's a little wild. Well, yes. Her manners are. Blunt. Rustic. But she has an excellent heart. She's lonely. She has a, a passionate nature. Mm. And she's susceptible. Mm. She needs a husband. I was her tutor, you see. Yes. And I have watched her grow up. You are not so much older. We grew close, until I thought it wise to keep my distance. Affectionate friendship only. It would not have been right to let stronger feelings grow. Now, however, she is of age, and so, although we must be careful, I confess I am ready to allow a closer tie. Passionate? Rustic? Susceptible? Maybe he's right about her. But why is it that all the time Rashley is speaking, Frank just wants to smash his face in? Kidneys? Yes. Frank has not even whispered to himself that he is falling in love with Di Vernon. But when he hears Rashley talk of her in that way, as if she is his sweetheart and she is merely flirting with Frank, it puts him in a fury. Black pudding? Hmm. And next morning, at the breakfast table, he cannot disguise his hostility. Don't you like black pudding? Or even admit to himself why he is behaving in this boorish manner. What's the matter, Frank? Nothing. Are you really cross or just pretending? Forgive me, it is of no concern. What is it? Have you gone over to the enemy? <laughs> What's Rashley been saying to you? It really is of no concern. You mean it's no concern of mine? Very well. As you must know by now, I have to make my own way here. So I don't take offence easily, and I've learned to keep my upper lip as stiff as you like. I wish you a happy digestion of your toast and your temper. You'll find me in the library if you need me. Yes? I've come to apologise. Good. So what did he say to you? Who? You know who. Rashley, what did he say about me? Nothing. I had bad news from London. A letter from my father. We've fallen out, you know, and he's being very disagreeable. Is that right? Y yes, I'm sorry. I see. So what did he say to you? Who? Rashley. Come on, Frank, I'm not an idiot. I flatter myself you might have noticed that by now. Rashley's at the bottom of everything that goes on here. I told you that. You said he was your ally. There are certain things between us. But there's nothing he could say to you that you could not repeat to me. He said nothing. It was just chat. Just a private conversation. Oh, for God's sake. Tell me the truth, or I swear I will make you sorry you lied and prevaricated in this cowardly way. I only... I can't... Oh, come on, Frank. Just tell me. 
Pretend I'm a third party, with no interest in the matter. Pretend you're broadcasting on the home service. Use short sentences and ration the adjectives. Since you insist. He conveyed to me... He insinuated that he had kept you at a distance while he was your tutor because of certain feelings between the two of you. But that now you're of age, there might be some understanding. Understanding? I understood a romantic attachment. Between me and... With Rashley? Yes. And you believed him? I saw no reason not to. Didn't you? I'd rather die. I'd rather become a nun. If he was the last man on earth and I was dying of loneliness, I would run the other way as fast as my legs would carry me. If he has... If you... If he has upset, offended you in any way, I will make him. I will make sure that he... No, no, Frank, sit down. Please, sit down. I don't want you involved. In any case, you can't hurt him without hurting others. He has protection. (sighs) Or believe me, I would have taken a five iron to the back of his misshapen head. But I can't. I'm not afraid of him. But you must leave him alone. Understand? Please. For my sake. Promise me. If you want. Thank you. He's dangerous. He's dangerous to me. I can't tell you why, but it means I can't openly go against him. I must be careful, and I ask you to be careful too. Not to get across him. He's going to London in a few days. So until then, just keep out of his way. Frank does as she asks. But he also writes a confidential letter to Owen, warning him to be on his guard against the new replacement. He doesn't like the thought of Rashley in his place, but he reckons that Owen is canny enough. Frank also notices that, despite everything she has said to him, Di Vernon has several long, private meetings with Rashley. This does not make Frank any fonder of him. He takes a little exercise to suppress his feelings. (laughs) Rashley, I did not know you were a student of the noble art. I boxed from my school. Oh, did you now? Which school was that? Would I have heard of it? And you? I boxed from my county. Did you? I see. That's why your nose... No. This is its natural shape. Ah, I'm so sorry. We must have a boat whenever you like. Now then, you have no gloves. Isn't it about time we took the gloves off? If you like. Uh, The grass is a little slippery. You better watch your step thing. I only wanted to... Frank is on his guard, and it is just as well, because Rashley comes at him with no warning. A straight right, fast and accurate, and he only just manages to save himself by springing back. Then they circle, fainting and probing. Rashley has more weight and he's broader in the shoulder, but Frank has the longer reach, and from the graceless, heavy way Rashley moves, Frank does not expect too much trouble. In fact, he is wondering how best to bring the bout to a conclusion without hurting Rashley too much. But this is a mistake. What he lacks in technique, which is not as much as Frank thought, he amply makes up for in ferocity. And when Frank slips and goes down on one knee, Rashley does not pause, but attempts to put his knee into Frank's face. And Frank only avoids it by a whisker. We're not playing by the Queensby rules, then. I'm terribly sorry. Didn't you know? I never was. Frank is starting to get angry. He has decided he will knock Rashley down as soon as he may. But when he comes forward, Rashley tries to sweep his feet and partially succeeds. But as Frank falls, he grabs Rashley by the throat and they both go down and land with Frank on top, his hands round Rashley's throat with every intention of choking the life out of him. Until suddenly, he feels himself lifted bodily into the air. Mr Frank, will you murder your cousin? Given half a chance, Mr Rashley. You think men will trust you in affairs of importance and delicacy when you go about brawling like a drunken gilly? Let me up! No. This is none of your business, Roy. The two of you. I warn you, if either of you wish to keep at it, I'll serve you out. I'll serve you both out. Do you doubt me? No. I can't say I do. Mr Rashley, I have news to tell you. So you'll cool down and come to yourself. 
and walk with me, please. And you, Frank Oswald, go home like a good bairn. So what with one thing and another? When Rashley finally sets off for London, Frank is not very sorry to see him go. And he is delighted to see that neither is Di Vernon. Goodbye, fair cousin. Goodbye, Rashley. Look out for yourself in the big bad city. Or should the big bad city look out for you? Mm, good is where we see it. I shall look for it as much there as here. Goodbye, Frank. Huh. I look forward to our next meeting. Ghastly little hypocrite. Thank God he's gone. We should do something to celebrate. Fancy nine holes? I, I don't really... Oh, play. no, I forgot. I know, you can caddy for me. I'd be delighted. <laughs> I can't see it. Has it gone far? It's in the rough. Come on. You might wonder why Frank is happy watching Rashley go off to take his place. Why doesn't he write to his father to beg release from his banishment at Osbold Hall? Why doesn't he yearn for Paris again and the little place on the left bank where he used to drink his café au lait? Well, it's fairly obvious, isn't it? Miss Di Vernon is the reason. Damn. I'll need a long iron. Her beauty. Right. No, a medium. Seven. That one. Right. That one. Her charm. That one, Frank, you dimwit. The one with the number seven on it. Right. Sorry. The mysterious dangers that surround her and the fortitude and sang-froid with which... Bloody hell! Why do I bother? Bloody thing. With which she seems to face them. Frank takes more and more pleasure in her company. And she, he likes to think... It's in the bunker. In his. I know it's in the bunker, Frank. I'm not blind. Come on. Uh, it's a bit steep, this bit, with the clubs. Oh, come on. <laughs> Give me the putter and catch me up. The putter. Here. I'll be fine. Go through the trees. I'll see you on the green. You, Oswald? I beg your pardon? Are you Frank Oswald? Oswald. Have we met? We have now. Why is your father gone to New York? What? Is it because you're mixed up in this free state robbery? I beg your pardon? He's lying low, is he, your father? But what? look, it's Rob Roy I really want to talk to you about. Who are you? Jim Brady, Glasgow Herald. I'm writing a piece on Rob Roy. Who? <laughs> Very good. When you and Rob took O'Brien, did you know he was carrying the money for the Irish Free State? I did. We think O'Brien is paymaster for the Irish agents tracking down their enemies over here? Unfinished business from the Civil War? We think there's going to be blood. Were you trying to nip that in the bud? Are you working for the British government? Or Rob Roy? Who is Rob Roy? <laughs> Frank, everyone's heard of Rob. He's in the meatpacking business. He runs the protection rackets round our way. He's got fingers in pies. Other people's fingers, mostly. <laughs> I don't know anything. So, when the news of the robbery got out, that's when your daddy decides to skip. Coincidence? I haven't heard from my father. I have nothing to say to you. Please yourself. I'm going back to town. Here's my card. Nice to meet you, Frank. Oh, who's the girl? Oh, goodbye. Who was that? A reporter from the Glasgow Herald. What did he want? Did he ask about me? No. He wanted to know about Rob Roy. Rob Roy? Oh. I'm going to the village. To see if there are any letters for me. Fine. I'll carry my own clubs. <laughs> What did you say your name was? Frank Osborne. Uh, just a minute. Thank you. It has occurred to Frank he's had nothing back from Owen. And nothing from his father. Frank Osborne. Hmm. 
Here. Oh, thank you. Dear Mr. Frank, I take the liberty of sending you a cheque for current expenses. Your father is on his way to America, from where, strictly between you and I, we hear alarming reports of the market. But Mr. Rushley is helping me hold the fort. He seems to be a, a sober, steady young man, and has taken to the business. I only wish another person had turned his mind that way, but no matter. Do, Do write, write when you have a moment. We long to hear your news. Your old friend Owen. He hasn't read my letter. Something's happened to it. Rashly again. I'd like to send a telegram. A, a telegram? Hmm. Oh, goodness. Um, I'll, I'll find your form. Uh, we have one here somewhere. He sends a telegram to Owen and waits for some time, hoping for a reply, but none comes. By the time he's walked back to the hall, it's going dark. For some reason, he wanders round by the library, where he knows Di is most likely to be spending her evening, as she usually does, alone. But, thrown against the blinds are the silhouettes of two figures. Hers and another. A figure that is clearly male. Who can that be? Yes? Die? You know you needn't knock. No. I am alone. Are you? Yes. Why wouldn't I be? I don't know. What's the matter? Nothing. I was just reading. I was reading your book. Oh? You're browning. And I found this piece of paper. I think it's poetry. Is it? Listen. I have lived through various torments, seen the smoke whipped from the grimy smokestack, dirty flowers, my own shrieking nerves. I suffered for my soul's blots, and I spat on love. <laughs> <laughs> it's brilliant <laughs> What? Is it? Oh, a brilliant parody The pomposity, the self-absorption Someone's caught The lack of any craft or intellectual rigour The hideous adolescent awfulness of modern poetry It's mine <laughs> It is my translation of a poem by Jules Le Fourg. Is it? It's brilliant <laughs> It was not meant as a parody. <laughs> I, I'm a great admirer of Lafour. Uh, um, uh, I, I beg your pardon. I do beg your pardon. I, I wonder if you ought to spend time on things like this. Well, you don't approve of translation? You, you think I should write original verses? Not really. I think your time might be better spent. Really? How? I don't know. Journalism? What? Novels? Oh, don't be angry. But angry? I'm, I'm not angry. I, I value your honesty. Who was here just now? Who? No one. Yes, there was. No. Someone. A man. I saw him against the blind. You're mistaken. There was no one. Frank finds himself in a strange condition. Now Rashley is gone, he has died to himself. He can see as much of her as he likes. He should be in heaven. But there's no trust. He thinks about her all the time. He thinks she's thinking about him. He catches her looking at him sometimes. She knows he's watching her. And he can tell she resents it. She's embarrassed and angry. Sometimes he thinks she's going to turn on him and have it all out. But then her courage fails. Or something else stops her. When I asked her about the man I had seen in the library, she was afraid. And she's a brave girl. What's making her so scared? Who is this man? The man Frank saw silhouetted against the blind. He is determined to find out. He tells himself he is concerned for her and that it is not jealousy that leads him to watch the library windows every evening, looking out for the shadow of some man, no doubt young and handsome. Until... Again, he sees shadows moving, runs quickly and quietly to the door of the library, hesitates with his hand on the latch, and then... Frank! Sorry. Has something happened? Uh, no, no. I, I, I was looking for my books. I, I, I just remembered. Which books? Uh, my Browning. I left my Browning. It's here. So it is. You don't usually smoke in here. No. You don't usually smoke at all. 
No. But you've left a cigarette burning in the ashtray. Have I? So I have. I'll put it out. I, I quite fancy a Casper. Do you have any more? No, that was the last. Oh, no matter. I have some. Here. I won't, thanks. Because you don't actually smoke, do you? I do. Take one, then. Thank you. A light? Thank you. <coughs> Here. <coughs> Have some water. <coughs> Thank you. You're quite right. Hmm. I don't smoke. And that wasn't your cigarette? No. Whose was it then? It belonged to a friend. A friend? A male friend? Someone I love dearly. I see. I won't have questions. I won't ask any then. I won't have your accusations. I won't make any. Yes, you will. You do. You're just not saying the words. You come bursting in here, spying on me. I don't care which fine fellow your little cigarette belongs to. I've woken from a pleasant but deceiving dream. I will relieve you of my presence. Oh, don't be such a pompous idiot. Stop it, Frank. Please, stop. Don't leave like this. I don't have so many friends that I can afford to throw one away. Even the selfish and ungrateful ones. I I'm not going to tell you anything about the damned cigarette. But I will not, I will not quarrel with you over it. A beautiful young lady cannot have an unlimited number of male friends. Not more than one special friend. Not without making jealous any man who... You jealous? On such paltry grounds? That's the sort of love that boys and girls repeat from plays and stories until they believe it. They talk themselves into love, and then when their so-called love turns out to be nothing but invention, they talk themselves into jealousy. Let's not demean ourselves. Such feelings are out of the question anyway, Frank. Why don't we just have a bit of plain, honest, disinterested friendship? Frank, can't we be friends? I want to be friends. Yes. I suppose so. We must part friends anyway, because you have to go. Go? Why? There's a telegram for you. A telegram? It's from someone called Owen. Why didn't you show me this straight away? I had other things on my mind. Owen is my father's right-hand man. Yes, I know. He says, since my father went to America, Rashley's got control of the business. Well, I never. And then absconded. Owen's gone looking for him. In Glasgow. Yes. You don't seem surprised. Well, I know Rashley. And I read the telegram. This is all my fault. Not entirely. How am I going to make it right? By going to Glasgow, obviously. So you do have a Mr. Owen staying here? Yes, sir. But he hasn't been using his room. What do you mean? He arrived three days ago. He seemed perfectly happy with the accommodation, but his room has not been slept in. Where is he, then? I'm afraid I cannot say. Well, did he leave a message for me? I'll look, sir. Oh. Keep looking at him. Wh what? Don't look at me. Look where he's gone. He's telephoning the Jarvie twins to ask what to do with you. Wh you need to get out of here. Who are the Jarvie? Meet me on the bridge tonight at 12. Until then, keep your head down. There's no message, sir, but hold for a minute, sir. I have telephoned for our security manager. He'll be here right away to help you. No, thank you. I can't wait. I'm sorry. Good. You're here. Follow me. Who are you? I can't just... What is it you fear? Who do you think sees your life as so important that they would want to take it from you? I'm not afraid. Then you should be. If you were caught with me, we'd both be for the job. It is you, Rob Roy. Keep your voice down and keep moving. Why are you helping me? My enemy's enemy is my friend. Where are we going? To prison. Who's there? Dougal, have you forgotten Hanan Gregarach? Rob! Rob, man, what are you doing here? If they catch you... They won't. Your man Owen, let's have him. He's in here. Oh, Mr. Frank. Owen, what's going on? I have been incarcerated by some 
I was going to say gentlemen, but they are not. The Jarvie brothers. We thought they were a respectable firm. And we did business with them before the... before the crash. Crash? Your father's firm is broke, Frank. What? There have been many failures. <sighs> the market and Rashley. Your father has gone to New York to do what he can, but Rashley has taken what was left. The scoundrel. <sighs> I pursued him here. And I thought in our difficulties, our old friends in Glasgow may give me credit. Far from it. They have imprisoned me. They have uttered threats. Oh, they threats? Have... Won't be just threats for long. You're lucky you've got both your knees. We need to leave town. Who is this gentleman, Frank? This is Rob Roy. I have heard of him. I should hope so. Come on. I owe you an explanation, Mr. Osbald. Do you? It was I who robbed O'Brien, and I did it with our friend, Rashley. I rather thought so. I did it for the fun of the thing, and the uh, money, of course. Uh, but Rashley never told me that O'Brien was a courier for the Free State. Was he? He was carrying money to their men in the Highlands. Why would the Irish Free State have agents in the Highlands of Scotland? Because that is where their enemies have run to, mostly. The Republicans. That war is over. I think it may rumble on for a month or two yet. And so does Rashley, for he has changed sides, I believe. Why? I wouldn't be surprised if money had something to do with it. That and a little disappointment in love. Uh, uh, where are we going? I'm taking you to Osbald Hall. Why there? Well, you have friends there. Or a friend, don't you? I'm not so sure. There doesn't seem to be anyone here. I'll take a peep about the place. Owen, are you all right? Uh, I'll stay in the car. Very well. Hello. Don't I know you? You. You're the magistrate. And you're the boy who did the stick-up. I didn't. No, no, stick to your story. And in any case, it was all to the good, you know. O'Brien's men were after Di's father, Vernon. Did you know that? What? Yes, her father. He was hiding here, you know. Oh, long gone now, both of them. Her father? I never knew... I thought... I was led to believe she was an orphan. <laughs> yes, that was the idea. The Free State men were trying quite hard to kill him, you know. Mm. They'd set a bounty on his head. The only person who found out he was hiding here was Di's cousin, Rashley. And he twisted the secret round her neck like a cord. Where is she now? Is she with her father? Uh -huh. Ask no questions, hear no lies. Where is my uncle and my cousins? Ah, now, that I can tell you. Playing a tournament in Lytham St. Anne's. Which means I can walk home without fear of being brained by a little white ball. I only popped over because your uncle asked me to keep an eye on things. There's a fire in the library. Make yourself at home. I'm not going to stay long. But he stands for a moment, looking into the fire and thinking about his hopeless passion for Di Vernon and his stupid, baseless jealousy and his conviction that he will never see her again. Frank? Di! Keep your voice down. What? What, what are you doing here? We're waiting for a boat. My father and I... You know my father is... Yes, yes. We were hunted out of the docks in Glasgow. We had to come back here. Brashley... Is he here? I'm afraid he might be. My father... <gasps> what was that? Oh, God! Oh, Mr. Frank Owen. Rashley. He's what? shot a man on the drive. My father? Oh, God! Father! It's all right. Die. He's only winged. He's got to go back to face the music, I'm afraid. The state has a few questions for him. I'm all right, Di. You, Frank, you stay back. Rashley, I pity you. Come a step nearer and I'll blow her brains out. This is how it is, you see, Frank. Rashley has always had a gun to my head. You understand the mystery now, I hope. No, I wouldn't count on it. Our cousin is a little hard of thinking. We'll take his car. Can that fill Oaten Drive? Frank, don't! If he doesn't shoot me, he will certainly shoot you. Well, you suggested it, my dear. As always, an inspiration. Die, oh. Frank! I warn you, take another step towards me and I will take great pleasure in putting a bullet between your eyes. 
Oh, hell. Maybe I'll just do it anyway. Frankie means it! Frank! I, I believe he meant it. He clipped my shoulder. Curse you! My shooting was better. I curse you, Frank Osbald! Curse you! Is he dead? Yes. Mr. Roy, thank you. As I've saved your life, you may call me Rob. And as I've taken his, I must be on my way. Die Vernon, will your father do? He's all right. I'm fine. Thank you. Miss Diana, I cannot always be this young man's guardian angel, so <laughs> you'd better supply the loss and marry him. Thank you, Rob. I will. What? Frank. Die. I know you love me, and in time, I suppose, I may grow accustomed to you. Thank you. But promise me one thing. Anything. Promise me you won't write any poems for me, to me, <laughs> or about me. I'll try my best to pass this test. <laughs> Your every whim shall Yes, be... all right. Are you happy now, both of you? Yes. Yes. And that's it. Shed Suez! Strike up! Shed Suez? What does it mean? It means strike up. Strike what? A match for your cigar at an outside table on Boulevard Saint-Germain? No. The pipes, my bonny lads and lasses. The pipes! In Rob Roy, Paul Reddy played Frank, and Denise Goff, Di Vernon. Mark Bonner played Rob Roy. Christian Rodska, Quentin and Frank's father. Joe McFadden, Rashley. Michael Eaves, Owen. Stuart McGugan, Uncle Hilary, Vernon and the Postmaster. Paul Reed, O'Brien. And Callum O'Neill, Dougal, Henry and Cummings. With David Tennant as Walter Scott. All other parts were played by members of the cast. The music was composed and performed by Ross Hughes and Esben Chalva. Rob Roy by Walter Scott was adapted for radio by Robin Brooks, produced and directed by Clive Brill, and was a Pacificus production for BBC Radio 4. And next week in the Great Scott series, you can hear Waverley. The London Book Fair is now in its 42nd year and continues to be one of the most important events in the book calendar. Tom Tivnan, the features editor at The Bookseller, will be unearthing the hot topics in Open Book here on Radio 4. That's in a couple of minutes.